Kansas City thrust into the national debate over immigration. Now it's spilling over into Kansas. Lee Summit School's now in a search for a new leader as its superintendent resigns. A former Kansas governor in the spotlight, and Thursday is inauguration day. What's the first big change we'll see as Councilman Lucas officially becomes Mayor Lucas? Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlies Borley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes. What a week it has been, and we have our power panel of journalists to help make sense of it all for you. From the Tribune News Service, nationally syndicated columnist Mary Sanchez. From KNBC 9 News, chief political reporter Michael Mahoney. From the Kansas City Call newspaper, senior writer Eric Wesson, and columnist and editorial writer Dave Helling of your Kansas City Star. Inauguration day is straight ahead. Inauguration for the new mayor of Kansas City, more than a month after Quinton Lucas defeated Jolie Justice at the polls. Only at 8.30 a.m. on Thursday will he get to officially call himself mayor. That ceremony taking place on the steps of City Hall. First of all, is anyone allowed to go to that event, Dave? Yeah, I think it's open to the public, you know, assuming that it doesn't rain or is miserable. I th there may be preferred seating, but my understanding yeah. is it's open to the public. Yeah. So It's just one event that he's doing. Lucas is also getting a smattering of criticism for hosting a champagne event next Saturday <laughs> at Union Station, where tickets top out at $3,000. Did he get a pass for that as long as he's also hosting a free event in the crossroads the night before or is it not a good look for a mayor who during the campaign once declared he was going to be the mayor for poor people Eric it's not a good look but it's the norm I think uh, the money is going toward his campaign re-election or his campaign is paying for it uh, it's not really anything out of the norm the only thing the only uh, comments that I've heard is everything is west of truth and for a guy that said that he was going to be doing so much in the central city for the urban core he's got nothing in the urban core. Did that surprise you Mary? It didn't surprise me because it might not have been him that planned these things and that unfortunately is the problem is that when you don't have someone a voice to pop up and say exactly what you just did you have some of these problems however the event at Union Station has a $75 ticket too. That's still far too high for some people, but it's going to be what he does after Thursday. How accessible is he? And one of the things about Quentin is that he's bicultural. He's comfortable in a lot of different class yeah. levels, race levels, and that's what I'm looking, frankly, to see from him after Thursday. Well, starting at 8.31 a.m. on Thursday morning, uh, Michael Mahoney, what major changes or change could we see in Kansas City as a result of that changing of the guard from Sly James to Quinton Lucas? There's going to be an emphasis, emphasis on a, a couple of different things here. Uh, he's going to try to move ahead with some sort of affordable housing uh, initiative fairly quickly. Um, the idea of making Kansas City a safer city is like turning around an ocean liner. That's going to take, uh, take some time uh, as well. But uh, look for that to be one of the, uh, the first things that he works on uh, in terms of affordable ho housing. He has yet to pick his uh, council pro, uh, pro tem, the number two vice president mayor, if you want to want to be that. And he's also going to scale back the number of committees down at City Hall. There may be as few as three. I doubt it's going to be that uh, uh, that sharp of a reduction, but there are going to be less of them. And I'm not sure there's going to be an airport committee. Okay. So th these are very procedural in many respects. How about as members of the public, Eric, will we see any noticeable difference quickly? Hopefully infrastructure. Because uh, yeah, we still right. got potholes in July or in August when he takes office, there'll still be potholes. So I think people will see a difference with infrastructure. I think he'll have a different approach with the police department and the chief of police than the previous mayor, uh, Mayor James. So I think those things will be what people see immediately. And to all, all of this is right, I would add just a couple of things. The mayor, the current mayor's commission on pension reform is finishing its work and could have a final report out next week, just as Mayor Lucas, Mayor-elect Lucas, takes office. Pension reform is going to be a big challenge for the new council, and he'll need to sort of understand how he's going to address that. And the other thing to keep in mind is the election on Martin Luther King and the Paseo is set for November, and that means that in the first 90 to 100 days, 
the mayor is going to have to sort of really massage that issue because that has the uh, uh, potential of being a pretty explosive vote, and that's going to be an early challenge. KNBC 9 News, by the way, is about to release a new documentary that takes you inside the Lucas campaign. The station got candid access to the final week of the race in exchange for not airing that footage until after the election. In the documentary that runs Tuesday night on KMBC, you'll see Lucas's campaign staff get upset about the appearance of nasty ads against his opponent, which they worry they'll be blamed for and could ultimately hurt their own campaign. And this frustration over losing endorsements, including from city councilwoman Heather Hall. Got a call from Heather Hall, who's endorsing Jolie. No, what? Also got a message from Alicia. That's the not as bad news. Uh, and she's like, hey, we need to talk later. Is she calling you right now? What's up? Is she calling you right now? Is she? I can't hear anything, because I'm deaf. Yep. It's Quentin Lucas. Hey, would you be interested in a formal endorsement? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, bye-bye. Oh, man, I hate That's politics. Good. I hate politics. I'm so glad you made the ask. I was going to be like, you better make that ask. Good, good, good. Heather Hall doesn't mean anything next to that. All right, all, all right. right. Now, the Alicia they're talking about there is councilwoman and losing mayoral candidate Alicia Kennedy. What did we learn, though, about this man who will soon be leading us that we didn't know before, Michael? That he is, um, A, he's got a, a decent sense of humor. B, he is a very hard worker. C, he's, he's a quite an intense individual. And, uh, and D, he never really um, uh, felt like uh, the, this was out of the question, that he could become mayor, even though everybody considered Jolie Justice a favorite. And there were polls that had him ahead. They weren't doing much polling in this race. Um, and uh, so they, they worked. Hard. They worked very, uh, uh, very hard. He was a hard worker. What about Jody Justice? Was there a documentary in the works for Jody Justice? We went to the Justice campaign and we asked them for the same sort of access that uh, we got from the Lucas campaign. They declined to do it. We were prepared to put cameras on both uh, both campaigns for the final week. The way it turned out, we had Lucas. Well, the program, by the way, is part of the KNBC Chronicle series. It's called Mayor, the Quentin Lucas Playbook. It runs Tuesday night at nine on Channel 9. In a column this week, the star's Dave Helling suggests that without Kathleen Sebelius in the race for United States Senate, Kansas Democrats can kiss goodbye to claiming Pat Roberts' seat next year. Sebelius is the former Kansas governor who went on to become health secretary in the Obama administration and is the only Kansas governor in history to be parodied by Saturday Night Live after the health care plan's rollout was riddled with technical problems. I'm Kathleen Sebelius, Secretary of Health under President Obama. Now, a lot of folks have been talking about our new health care enrollment website, how it's been crashing and freezing and shutting down and stalling and not working and breaking and sucking. So really, Dave Helling, Kathleen Sebelius is the only chance for Democrats? Well, I would, you know, my column got some reaction from Democrats and from Republicans, so let me try and explain what I was trying to say. <laughs> Kansans have elected Democrats to be governor. In fact, they have a Democratic governor now, and they have a history of that. They've elected uh, Democrats to House seats, uh, Nick, Jim Slattery, Dan Glickman, Nancy Boyda, uh, uh, um, uh, others. But they haven't elected a Democrat to the U.S. Senate since 1932, and there's a reason for that. Uh, and so what I was trying to say is that you need someone with a little star power Whoever the Republicans nominate, you're going to have to someone who, have someone, it seems, on the Democratic side who gives some energy to the electorate. And I don't think Barry Grissom is the guy. Mary to. Sanchez, yeah. but, but there's also Congresswoman Nancy Boyder who is running Sorry. in that race. Yes, the U.S. Attorney Barry Grissom. State Senator Barbara Bollier is also very much interested in that. Is, is the star selling these individuals <laughs> short by saying only Kathleen Sebelius could win this? I wouldn't necessarily say that. I mean, I think Dave is right in that Kathleen has a very high name recognition. I've actually, though, been pretty surprised by how many people are supporting Barry Grissom already. And I don't know, I don't know, will he be able to play kind of the law enforcement role, law and order, and draw some more votes that perhaps some of the other candidates might not be able to? It's 
Michael, I don't know. Um, Dave was mentioning the star power aspect of it, but Laura Kelly is the governor of Kansas. She wasn't somebody with amazing star power. She was just a state senator from Topeka. I think there is star power uh, in this race from a Democratic perspective, and that's Chris Kobach. And I think that uh, in a crowded Republican primary, he may only need 30 percent of the vote to win the Senate nomination. And if that's the case, that's a dream scenario for um, uh, for the de for the Democrats, Grissom got into this race uh, after making a phone call, or at least la formally launched it, talking to Sebelius, and is convinced that she is absolutely out. Dave, that's uh, that, that's what your sources re were reporting as well. Yeah. Now, while Kathleen Sebelius is still a question mark, Republican Kansas Senate President Susan Wagel makes it official. She's in it to win it. Susan Wagel is now ready for a new fight, a fight to take on the radical left in Washington and give President Trump the conservative reinforcements he needs. After talking to my family and listening to hardworking taxpayers all across Kansas, and after months of praying for guidance, I've decided to announce that I'm officially a candidate to represent Kansas in the United States Senate. That was Susan Wagle's campaign video. Of course, not the only Republican who thinks they have what it takes to be our newest United States senator. As already mentioned on this program, Chris Kobach already in the race. So is State Treasurer Jake LaTurner and former Chiefs player and Johnson County Commissioner Dave Lindstrom. But does her arrival make her the front runner, Dave? No, I, I think the front runner is Chris Kobach, particularly as the field widens. You know, he lost the race to Laura Kelly. But he won the primary against a sitting Republican governor. That shows he has some support somewhere and basically drew even with Kelly in every county except Johnson County. So again, I'm just trying to make the point that you got to beat somebody with somebody. And Kansas has a history of nominating Democrats who don't win. Mary. That's true on the Democratic side. Chris Kobach will be a force here. He's, he does present well. And a, and a lot of people like to hear what he says. He is also has a lot of problems, though, in that, I mean, he's been parading around at the border lately. I've written about that, trying to build his own wall. He's gotten into it with even the municipal officials down there. That could easily be plied by anyone going against him and make him, frankly, just sound crazy. Eric. But he comes with baggage. You know, the voter ID fraud uh, working and come to find out there, there wasn't any fraud. So he comes with a lot of baggage. And, uh, and I was watching one of the Republicans say, well, he lost to Laura Kelly, so he's the one to turn the state into what it is now Did, or, or something say, negative about the, it. But, you know, he comes with some baggage, so I don't think he's a shoe in The for baggage it is not only positions, which I think may matter less in a Senate race than a governor's race, but he is a terrible campaigner. He's disorganized, doesn't raise money. I mean, he was a mess in the governor's race. And in a Senate race, that will matter, too. Well, yet, at the same time, in a U.S. Senate race, there are nat national issues at stake right. rather than some and wonky... national people, too. And national right. people rather than, than wonky state issues. I don't know if that will play well for Senator Wag uh, Waggle in this as, as well. And, plus, she, uh, in her announcement, she was talking about uh, being a Trump ally, talking about being tough on the border. That sounds like Chris Kobach White. We talked about him last week. Now he's gone. The Help Wanted sign out for a new superintendent in the Lee Summit School District as Dennis Carpenter resigns. To ease the pain of saying goodbye, Carpenter is getting a $750,000 payoff from the district. You may remember just three years ago, the district parted ways with its previous superintendent, who also got a payout. So in three years, Lee Summit Schools has paid out $1.2 million to move its leaders out the door. That could have paid for 30 more teachers, according to KCTV5. But why the resignation was the racist in chief remark he made last week about President Trump, the straw that broke the camel's back, Mary? It perhaps might have been. I think you could probably predict that this would be the end of that he would eventually have to resign. You don't tweet something like that. It's, you know, he needs to represent the entire district. I have written columns where I have called the president racist, but I waited to do it and I took a whole column to explain myself. He, that's not the type of thing that you can do and particularly not in this day and age. You know, he needs to lead, he needed to lead a whole entire district. It took a mediator to finally be able to turn the votes to get the equity training approved. 
that they need to have there, be it every district does. Michael. You know, there's nothing uh, really sort of more disturbing in some respects than a good school district in turmoil. And that's where it seems like the Lee Summit District is descending uh, as a result of this and the other problems with the superintendent and the equity uh, uh, contract. When this hap happens to school districts, and we've all seen it uh, uh, around here, it doesn't just, it doesn't stay out of the classroom. The turmoil seems to leak into it and it's very, and it's very unfortunate. And that's the real fear here. Mary, you wrote this week, for the good of all the students, let's hope lessons were learned by all involved. What was the biggest lesson in all of this? Well, I think, you know, to build the ground game and something got off track very early. They were able to bring the board members around to have people understand more about what this training was and what it wasn't. But that needed to happen ahead of time, behind the scenes. You still have issues, obviously, of transparency, that votes are there and people need to voice, but these are hard issues and you need to build understanding around it at many multiple levels so that you don't have these type of fireworks. The biggest lesson, Eric? I think the biggest lesson that we learned is a ballpark figure of what it costs to keep the status quo. Uh, uh, Dr. Carpenter was exposing the fact that uh, black children weren't ed being educated in the same manner as white children were. And bringing that to the, f to the forefront was something that they weren't really ready for. So I think what, what I learned and what I observed, one, is they were calling him controversial. Was he controversial because he brought these things to the light? And that's what people in that area didn't want to hear. So I think the biggest lesson we is how much will you pay to keep the status quo? In their case, I think they pay $750,000 to keep it the way that it was before Dr. Carpenter. And with two superintendents, that's over a million dollars they paid out. Is that really, though, any different than what happens in other industries when people well, are shown the door? Yeah, it's a pretty steep. Uh, uh, severance costs for two superintendents. And by the way, Nick, one of the problems this kind of turnover presents, in addition to the turmoil in the classroom that Mike talked about, is makes it harder to hire the next superintendent. I mean, people, who wants to go to this district when they're, uh, this, you know, <laughs> this infighting is so aggressive? Well, it means you have to pay more. You'll have to pay more, recruit harder, find somebody to do it. But it, you know, once you get into the idea of a district fighting over the superintendent over and over, it does make it harder to maintain quality, and I think Lee Summit wants it, to It's interesting, Michael. Can I just say this, Michael? Because sure, it's interesting sure. that, thank you very well, it's the people's show. I'm like, Ross Perot on this. Uh, but there is the sense that, you know, it used to be the Kansas City, Missouri School District, Kansas City, Missouri School District, right. negative headline, negative headline. That was suburban school districts. It's Shawnee Mission all the yep. time. Shawnee Mission, Lee Summit. That's a difference that's taking place now. But the, the turmoil is similar in the fact that, that it, it, it does disrupt a uh, district. What I wanted to, to uh, say on the tail of Dave's remark there is I've gone to uh, superintendent conventions and a big chunk at every school superintendent and convention is how to tell when you're losing your board, how to manage your portfolio, how to run your investments, when to realize that you're on, on the way out. The, uh, these guys are sort of like baseball managers. They get hired to be fired and uh, inside of the industry, uh, they know that. Is it good for education? No, it's not, but it's the reality of the business. It's always interesting to see how our city is viewed elsewhere in the country. This week, the local story getting more national media attention than any other this week was this one. For 25 minutes, ICE agents in Kansas City tried to make the arrest. I still have rights. But when Florencio Milan Vasquez refused to get out of his car, agents smashed his window and dragged him out while his small children cried in the back seat and his partner recorded the incident. I just want people to know that this is happening in our community, that this is real and it can happen to anybody. Homeland Security defends the arrest, saying the man they apprehended had crossed into the country illegally three times and had already been deported. But locally, this story took on more complexity as the Kansas City Police Department came under fire for aiding ICE with the arrest. But haven't local police cooperated with federal immigration authorities all along? What makes this different, if at all, Mary? It was filmed and the way it looks. KCPD, for probably several decades, I know numerous chiefs back, have always maintained a bit of a distance, and they even kind of did there. They were called to the scene, so they showed up. I think they need to make a special extra effort beyond just the chief's blog post to say that we understand that communities, that immigrants, 
feel very, a heightened sense of fear right now, but that we understand that you can be, if you're undocumented or not, you can be a witness to a crime, you can be a victim, or you can be a perpetrator. And they need that cooperation. The, the chief of police says in his blog that he actually, uh, there's a state law that requires, mandates that the police department offer backup when they're asked to by federal authorities, Michael. Well, indeed, and, and that, that's the way it should be. But, uh, but to Mary's point on this is the fact that it is on video and the fact that the, 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 this story pivoted so quickly from the arrest of this uh, this person to a major uh, dispute between um, some immigrant rights groups and the Kansas City Police is really important and it's, and it's pretty alarming. I don't know where this goes for, uh, from here. I hope it does not go down uh, a, a dark path. I don't think it will, but it was alarming to see it happen. Eric. You know, one of the things we talked about last week on this show was the relationship between the community and the police department. I don't think that video helped it. One of the things that I found was really interesting was that the chief responded to it. We got 78 homicides. The only response I've seen him have is they put a $25,000 bounty on people's heads for homicides. So this is something that he responded to immediately. And it goes back to if that lady hadn't had that camera videotaping it, what would the public have been told? But now people People actually see what the police are doing. It's kind of a different. Well, with well, the immigration issue different. also spilling over into Kansas this week, but the venom not directed at federal agents, not directed at local police officers, but the state's newest congresswoman. We are here today at the office of Representative Davids, holding her accountable for voting to give billions of dollars to racist Trump to build concentration camps. Let me into my congresswoman's office. I refuse to leave the establishment until my congresswoman commits to shutting down the concentration camps. I'm not here to argue with you, okay? I'm here to keep the peace, okay? Some people may have a hard time understanding why there are so many people angry at a Democratic lawmaker that some people view as so liberal that she shouldn't have even won that district, and yet they're out there protesting. What was what was her crime, according to well, these protesters? Well, she voted Dave? for a, uh, a supplemental appropriations bill that had some money in it for humanitarian relief on the border, but also presumed to have some money for uh, increased enforcement. Emmanuel Cleaver voted for the same bill, so anyone who thinks that this is some draconian right wing. So, so why, why aren't they outside of his office? I don't know. I don't know, They're except they want to make a point. But, but, so, but there was criticism, and we wrote about this from uh, uh, Alexandria or Cortez's chief of staff, whose name just went out of my head, who criticized. Sharice Davids is potentially racist, which we thought was over over the line. So there, there are fractures in the Democratic Party between you know people on the left who want to abolish Homeland Security and abolish ICE, and those who are more pragmatic like Sharice. But Davids. what if Sharice Davids had voted against that bill? Would not have put her in jeopardy in that district? That would been even worse. I mean, this is the reality of Congress: is that you have to make deals, and the reality of a split between the House and the Senate. People. I think, you know, understandably are so upset at what has happened at the border. They don't know what to do. And so you, you get this sort of overreach, I would think. I mean, I wrote, you know, you don't abolish ICE, you audit it. They need to make some changes in it. But to think that you can just get rid of a whole government entity and that it doesn't do, doesn't have a function that people might support it sometimes is wrong. Michael. This is why the politics and the dynamics of politics are so fascinating. Ten months ago, um, there were campaign TV commercials all over the place that Sharice Davids was an untrustworthy yes. radical. Okay, yeah. and now there, there are protests She's a in right front wing of nut job. <laughs> <laughs> now there are protests at her congressional office for, for being too, uh, too conservative. The fact of the matter is, is that I think Davis as a candidate was to the left of Davis. Uh, as a member of, of Congress. If she wants to keep this seat, and she does, she's tacking more to the se uh, center all the time. If you thought about heading to the Truman Presidential Museum this summer, you're too late. It's now officially closed for renovation, and those doors are going to remain shut for the next year. Last day, and I thought, daggone it, I better go. <laughs> 
Some of the visitors just getting in before the shutdown began. By the way, if you thought this might be a good time to experience our region's other major presidential library, the Eisenhower Museum in Abilene, Kansas, you need to know that's closed too. It's yet to reopen following its own $25 million renovation. Twelve months ago, a consultant's report says another area museum should close for a year, the American Jazz Museum. Did that ever happen, Eric? No. Uh, it wasn't recommended that they do. They kind of worked through uh, the issues that they had while they stayed open. They re kept getting exhibits. They still have exhibits there, so no, it's never closed. But is it still being subsidized by the city, Dave? Yeah, and yes. will be for some time, as the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum is, by the way, because of the city owning the building. I do believe the Jazz Museum has hired a director, yeah. and so they're making some yeah. progress on that front, and the new director uh, should, you know, obviously put together a, an agenda for improvement at the Jazz Museum, but the public subsidy of that structure will not go away anytime soon and may need to be increased in the years ahead. I mean, I think the Jazz uh, uh, facility needs to look no further than across the hall to the Negro Leagues Museum for a successful business plan. And part of that plan uh, includes reaching out to uh, other similar organizations in the sense of the Jazz Museum, it's gonna be the, mu the, the music business. They need to do that. Last week, we discussed a new push to ask the public what they want to see in our new look KCI airport. Eric Wesson says he'd like a shoe shine. Hold the front page. We get a call from this man, Rick Evans, who says he is the last remaining shoe shine at KCI Airport, but he acknowledges he's very hard to find, and there's no signage, but he's next to the Delta counter in Terminal B. Eric, he says Weekend Review must be a very popular show because he's been inundated with calls from concerned clients wanting to know if he'd hung up his shoe shining box. And he called me, and I said, I have never seen you there. And he, we explained, uh, he explained where he was was and so now I know if I'm ever flying Delta yes. I'll, I can see him but I appreciate him watching yes the show. and he is worried though that he hasn't been offered a spot in the new look KCI Airport that is our week in review our thanks to this week's news reviewers from the Tribune News Service Mary Sanchez and from the Cole newspaper Eric Wesson from KNBC 9 News Michael Mahoney and Dave Helling of your Kansas City Star I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT thanks for spending part of your weekend with us